Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Omar, for this wonderful introduction and for inviting me for this, uh, I think, an incredible uh, seminar and incredible, uh, this is really an incredible opportunity for me to uh, speak uh, across different disciplinary uh, lines and across uh, different um, conceptual frameworks. Uh, and uh, and I'm I'm really happy to present this work. This is definitely uh, you know presented this work in different forms uh, over the past year or two, and it's a kind of a collection of different ideas that will hopefully be part of a um, of a new manuscript that I'm working on uh, titled "When Wounds Travel," which which really documents a lot of my ethnographic research, my own personal um, practice as a as a public health expert in the Middle East, uh, working with Doctors Without Borders and working at the AUB, um, but also uh, some of my own personal uh, experiences as a physician uh, trained in Iraq, working in Iraq in the 1990s and later on kind of leaving Iraq uh, late in the 90s and uh, working also in Lebanon um, for that uh, for that period. So let me kind of start because I have a lot to cover uh, and I'm hoping that uh, through this lecture, I will be also uh, addressing uh, some of these uh, prompts that Omar uh, shared with the, with you all, uh, especially related to thinking about history, thinking um, uh, about how do we uh, re make and unmake the world. And, and, and so I'll, I'll uh, start my, my talk. And what I want to do, and I usually uh, uh, present this um, a video, uh, it's about five minutes or six minutes maybe, uh, really because it contextualizes a lot of what I want to do and allows me to kind of be more, um, uh, I freely kind of talk a bit about my work. So, uh, so with that, let me uh, start with that video. Along with all the problems that war brings, we're now facing a new enemy invader, emerging from Iraq. Each of its soldiers are packing weapons, dozens of them. These guys can survive for weeks at a time without food or water. We don't know how to fight them, but we've got to find out. Guns and tanks won't help us here. But as correspondent John Torres reports, what we really need is a good, biologist. There's a killer on the battle-torn streets of Iraq, but it doesn't carry a gun. It's attacking injured soldiers. With better armor and advanced medical care, they're surviving in larger numbers than ever before. I was a doctor in Iraq with the Air National Guard, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, the survival rate for wounded soldiers, it's a remarkable story but it's one with a downside. That downside comes in the form of a tiny microbe with a powerful punch. Here's the culprit. It's a bacterium called Bamanii, referred to in Iraq as Iraqibacter. It's named for microbiologist Paul Bauman, who researched it back in 1968. But even he couldn't predict what this tiny, single-celled organism would one day become. Like most bacteria, it lives in colonies and is constantly reproducing, simply by dividing and dividing again. A single bacterium can give rise to five billion trillion in only a day. This bug used to be relatively harmless, yet somehow it's found a way to transform itself into a drug-resistant killer. One of its many victims was ABC News correspondent Bob Woodruff. On January 29, 2006, while embedded with the U.S. 4th Infantry Division in Baghdad, his vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. We have some breaking news to report. Our co-anchor of World News Tonight, Bob Woodruff, and his... To keep him alive, doctors had to remove part of his skull and induce a medical coma. Miraculously, Bob was stabilized and evacuated to Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. 
His wife, Lee, was there by his side. What was going on with Bob at that point? He underwent many different surgeries for different things, but I think that's the point at which they became nervous about pneumonia and, and sepsis setting in. And in fact, that was what had happened. A Baumannii infection had spread throughout his body, and he was back at death's door. It seemed impossible to me that someone could be in a war and be hit by a bomb and survive this and then be actually felled by a simple bacteria in a hospital. Bob Woodruff is just one of many soldiers and civilians picking up this deadly microbe in hospitals along the evacuation chain out of Iraq and bringing it back home to America, where it's infecting even people who have never seen a battlefield. It has this ability to hang around in places where it ought not, like on doorknobs and pillowcases and, and the like. Where it can survive for weeks. So why not simply use an antibiotic like penicillin to fight it? After all, haven't antibiotics been the magic bullet saving soldiers' lives since World War II? We saved a lot of people's lives. Penicillin was a wonder drug. But something has changed. Now the bugs are fighting back. Microbiologist Mike Smith demonstrates how drug resistant this bug has become. You take Baumannii and you put it on a plate containing imipenum. He places colonies containing millions of bacteria in several petri dishes and confronts them with imipenum, an antibiotic so strong it's nicknamed gorillacillin. After 12 hours, all the bacteria should be dead, but they're not. Unfortunately, this is the kind of thing that we're seeing where uh, certain colonies are surviving, and, and in this case, you can see a few in the middle there. Now, looking at it, there's only six or eight little colonies. These are the only ones that are living, so the entire population now of remaining bacteria are imipenum resistant. So this is the strain. Smith and graduate student Tara Janoulis prepare a sample of Baumannii. Its DNA will be sequenced one letter at a time. The results reveal that Baumannii has large sections of genes that don't belong foreign genes that are giving it resistance to antibiotics. There is a multi-drug resistance strain that took 45 different drug resistance genes and stuck them in one spot. This should be alarming because that's what this bug can do. How is this possible? There's only one way we get our genes and that's from our parents. It's called vertical gene transfer. But it turns out bacteria can also get genes in a process called horizontal gene transfer. One way that happens is when two bacteria get together for a little friendly conjugation, the microbial form of snuggling. They form a connection and squirt DNA into each other. Turns out Baumannii has been getting a little too friendly. Could that be what's making it so nasty? To find out, Mike Smith zaps a colony of Baumannii with electricity, creating over a thousand mutant bugs, each one different, each one missing one known gene. He takes these mutant microbes and feeds them to some microscopic worms. an amazing little organism. Okay, so, so as we saw in this video, there's a lot to unpack here um, from questions of representations of, of, of this bug in terms of uh, calling it Iraqi Bacter to the kind of the erasure of the experiences of, of a lot of the Iraqis from uh, from this video. Uh, however, uh, uh, one of the things uh, that I wanted to do in uh, in this talk and in, in, in kind of in my work is to take this question of Iraqi Bacter seriously and um, and think about kind of how uh, we can understand this uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, problem of Iraqi Bacter beyond uh, beyond these kind of uh, problems of, of uh, representation here. So so 
one of the questions I've been asking uh, as a as a as both a, a physician and as an ethnographer is what is Iraqi about Iraqi Bakhtar, and to um, give you a little bit of a background context about antimicrobial resistance and 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 uh, and 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 specifically right now. Uh, the the first use of antibiotics as a at the industrial level happened uh, during the second world war so there's a kind of a very interesting connection that antibiotics have or antimicrobial resistance have also uh, with the kind of the uh, the history of war in general and of course people uh, uh, believe that you know this idea that penicillin will will br bring bring him home and the idea that basically um, uh, uh, the, that the, this the antibiotics is this this greatest healing agent of the war um, having some problems here uh, so one of the concepts that I wanted to uh, introduce here and work with throughout the presentation is this idea of the biology of history and and uh, the biology of history is a is a notion uh, developed by a, a historian of science, anthropologist of science, uh, Hannah Landeker, and specifically in her piece, uh, uh, in her piece, uh, antimicrobial resistance and the biology of history, and she defines the biology of history as the physical registration of. Uh, human history in bacterial life, and this basically this idea comes from the uh, the 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 history of mass production of antibiotics during the 1940s that involved the in very industrial scale growth of microorganisms uh, that are harvested for their metabolic products. So basically, antibiotics are uh, made through uh, uh, cultivating them through kind of bacteria themselves, um, and over subsequent the, uh, over decades, the development of individual therapies began, and the use of antibiotics on uh, on single pathogens and in, div in different individual bodies must be kind of seen here as a form of an environmental event. So every time we're we're using antibiotics, uh, we are creating an environmental event that. Uh, could be cultivating resistance within these uh, different pathogen, different bacteria, um, and and in many ways we have been influencing the evolution of this ba of bacteria uh, over time uh, through this kind of mass production uh, of uh, of antibiotics. So so one of the things that that Landeker uh, explores in thinking about the biology of history is thinking about this idea of the materiality of history and the historicity of matter. Um, and she argues uh, that in the history of biology, ideas of bacteria change. But in the biology of history, the bacteria of ideas change. And the bacteria of today are not necessarily the bacteria of yesterday. Whether that change is registered culturally, genetically, physiologically, ecologically, or medically. So bacteria today have different plasmids and uh, traits and, uh, uh, and interrelations and, and capacities and distributions and temporalities than bacteria before modern antibiotics. This biological matter chewing away its own ontology is historically and culturally and materially specific to this kind of period of late industrialism, uh, what we call the Anthropocene um, uh, in over the past few uh, decades of use of this term. And one of the things that this is not just a, a, a kind of a small scale issue, but on, the, on a global health and a public health level, antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance is, has become one of the leading global health issues uh, in, in the world. And according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, by the year 2050, if we are not going to be doing uh, a lot to... Uh, Response to antibiotic resistance, uh, antimicrobial resistance will be the leading cause of death across the world. So, killing around 10, 10 million people a year. So, 
so uh, this is this is a kind of a warning sign uh, that or a warning uh, appeal from the WHO that this is going to become the main public health problem in the uh, uh, across the globe if this is not being responded to at this point so imagine the idea of being injured very simple injury that will eventually cause death because there is no antibiotic that will uh, uh, respond to that infection and with with that kind of uh, uh, with that in mind, the WHO had kind of put these priority pathogens uh, list uh, over uh, uh, to created these kind of different lists. And, and, and lo and behold, Acinetobacter uh, has been seen as one of the number one uh, of the list of the priority or the critical pathogens that needed to be uh, addressed. So, so with this in mind, let me give you a little bit more of a background and ethnographic context uh, of the work that I've been doing and how I come to uh, how I came to kind of uh, uh, study this problem uh, specifically through my work on the aftermath on the aftermath and the consequences of the Iraq war. So one of the things that emerged after the uh, the 2003 war was the kind of the, the complete collapse uh, of uh, the Iraqi state under the occupation. And of course, at that time, there was a, 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 a plethora of articles and academics and media people and political pundits commenting on how Iraq has been historically ungovernable or or Iraq was kind of ungovernable for so many reasons mainly uh, uh, attributing this idea of ungovernability to the to Iraq's uh, uh, history as part of like different provinces under the Ottoman Empire that were put together under the British or the idea that there were the different ethnic groups and different sects that uh, uh, were seen as a kind of in conflict with each other. Uh, there are different theories that came out to try to justify or to uh, theorize this idea of Iraq's ungovernability. Uh, however, this uh, story of ungovernability, as, as I kind of w wanted to study, where does it come from? Where is the genealogy of this idea? Uh, it, it kind of, for me, became very clear that it, draw, it draws uh, a lot from this kind of colonial history of Iraq, especially under the British, uh, specifically uh, when the British tried to uh, take over Mesopotamia and during the First World War, actually many of their soldiers, uh, the main problems that the, the, the military faced were mainly health problems. Uh, soldiers dealt with uh, increasing levels of diarrhea or heat stroke, uh, cholera epidemic spread with the, with the arrival of the military. So, so one of the things that I tried to explore in my work is how that history of and discourses of Iraq's ungovernability has a certain genealogy that had to do with medicine, with the experiences of a lot of colonizers uh, and post-colonial kind of uh, governments in Iraq dealing with the country's population and dealing with the kind of the idea of uh, its, its kind of medical ungovernability. So I, uh, part of my work, uh, I tried to think about this history, and I kind of wrote this uh, in my uh, in my book, uh, looking at this genealogy of medical infrastructure in Iraq and thinking about medicine as a form of state building. So, so one of the central uh, problems for the British and the post-colonial uh, regimes of rule were how to uh, was one of the problems was how to really govern Iraq medically. How do you build a medical institutions and 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 develop certain kind of biopolitical -pol regimes of rule that will uh, uh, maintain the country within a certain kind of health uh, healthy public health uh, uh, sus sustainable public health uh, system and and one of the things that I tried to do in the work and a bit more on the theoretical level is to think uh, to think about this analytics of ungovernability as a form of a critique of uh, this, the certain articulations of biopolitics uh, as, as a kind of a done deal, as a fait accompli. Uh, the rather, for me, uh, biopower, uh, uh, as the way I analyze it, where I was seeing it as more of a something that is more enmeshed in the disordered operation of power, producing that which uh, what it disavows. 
so I'm happy to speak about this in more de in more details uh, later on in the Q and A. But just to kind of give you an idea here, and one of the reasons that I opted to write a historical account is because of the uh, very there's a lot of difficulties in dealing with that present moment. Uh, in Iraq and across the region in terms of conducting ethnography under the occupation or conducting uh, research in a very kind of highly um, uh, insecure place uh, in Iraq, especially after the, the 2003 invasion. Uh, but but the book was kind of also trying to set the stage for a kind of a, a, a later ethnographic project uh, to look at what happened in Iraq after the war and how we can um, uh, understand the longer consequences as of it. So so I in 2011, I arrived in Beirut to start my first job at the American University. And over there, I began a, a kind of a, a long term research project documenting what I call the therapeutic travels of the war injured uh, of Iraqis who are leaving Iraq, uh, despite uh, the the fact that many of them were did not necessarily have money, but they were leaving Iraq to seek health care uh, in Syria or in Lebanon. And uh, and there was a kind of a with with the Iraq war and with the also with the beginning of the Syria war, the entire region began to transform, especially around uh, the infrastructures of health care. So people were moving across different borders as refugees or as medical travelers, and they were trying to seek the security or health care in these different uh, uh these different uh, therapeutic, uh, what I call therapeutic geographies. Uh, so, so I got very interested in thinking about this idea of the traveling wound, capturing these forms of displacement and movement of bodies across the region, um, uh, uh, kind of with with all these uh, different forms of injuries as a form as very as a new endemic reality of this history and uh, uh, practices of wounding. And one of the I am being a kind of someone who is have a, have a, a wearing different hat between the sciences and the social sciences and the and the humanities. Uh, uh, my interest became uh, uh, focused on this idea of the biosocial life of the wound, uh, exploring these the entanglements of biological and environmental and social processes, uh, and, and 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 basically literally literally asking what is revealed in the wound. And here the wound not necessarily just I'm trying to think what it is or how can it be understood but but following it as a method following it as something that, that reveals a lot of these uh, social historical biological questions was kind of my aim and, and the way I was framing my my work here uh, and of course in addition to these physical injuries the the wound is is a had a much broader meaning or different kind of senses uh, so the idea of a social wound, uh, the, the idea of loss, of displacement, uh, the symbolic wound, uh, there's a lot of literature, a lot of art in Iraq that had, was dealing with this question of the wounded body. And of course, in, in, in Iraqi culture and music and in, in art and in, in poetry, the wound features in a very uh, central and strong way. But to go back to the uh, to the traveling wounds that I began to explore, one of the main observations there was the was the rise of the number of the of Iraqi patients uh, arriving to the American University Hospital, uh, especially after 2006 and 2007, at this kind of the height of the civil uh, conflict, civil war conflict, and the counterinsurgency operations by the U.S. So, so there were a lot of these cases coming into the hospital and in, over time they began to to increase dramatically and this began for me a kind of a, 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 an undertaking to document the, these transformations of healthcare landscapes across uh, the across Iraq and Syria Lebanon uh, and, and 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 using this this notion of the uh, uh, the region, looking at how the region is transforming as a as an entity, became very useful because we were seeing the problem of movement of populations beyond the idea of a health system or national borders, and beyond this idea also of 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 having an, a national population and a refugee camp. So we were looking at how patients and how people are moving across urban settings and across different nas uh, tra uh, national borders to seek healthcare in, in, these, uh, uh, in these countries. 
So, so this is a kind of a simple uh, uh, graph that we uh, put together at that time uh, with part of that publication that you saw for the Lancet. And in, in this, in, in this just kind of gives you a little bit the scale of the displacement, the scale and the, and the geographical scale of the movement of the, of, of the population. Uh, a lot of these are, were um, refugees, but then there is also a big number of people who are just moving to seek health care. Um, for for all kinds of you know injuries, cancer care, uh, heart diseases, all different chronic conditions and acute conditions. And one of the things that triggered my interest is a uh, some of the conversations with the surgeons and the doctors uh, at the American University of Beirut. So one of these doctors really kind of that quote uh, it was very powerful for me is is he, he was saying that we we see many tough cases coming from Iraq. They present with very advanced and aggressive types of cancer, which are unusual among younger population. We're also struggling with high rates of multidrug resistant bacteria among the injured in Iraq. These bugs could be transmitted to other patients. That is why we usually put Iraqis in isolation upon arrival until we confirm their microbiological status the microbiological status of their wounds. So, so there's something very different uh, experientially by these doctors about these injuries. They were seeing something uh, kind of an accelerated, uh, rapid experiences of, of cancer, uh, and then more of these drug uh, uh, resistant bacteria uh, kind of infecting a lot of these wounds. So a lot of these wounds would kind of are not healing in many ways. So, so these they always are open, open wounds uh, that uh, defined some of these experiences, both of cancer and of the um, uh, of of the uh, injured patients. And 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 as as I began to expand the project, uh, I began to uh, look at other hospitals, uh, specifically hospitals um, that were uh, developed by uh, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders. And this is kind of when I also began working with them uh, to uh, think about the trans these transformations in the region and help and thinking about the the the, the different health needs uh, across these states of the uh, east of the Mediterranean. And one of these hospitals really was established in 2006 and began to expand slowly. It, it began uh, uh, providing services for Iraqi patients. Uh, it mainly was in Amman because MSF was unable to function properly in Iraq because of the security situation. So they were get, bringing patients from uh, from Iraq and and uh, uh, getting them to to have plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery. Patients' average stay was about four months. Uh, some sometimes you get a, a, an entire family coming in. Uh, the you know one of these images you see like the father and his and his son. Both of them have been affected in a suicide bombing uh, uh, attempt or in a in an explosion by the U.S. military, um, and. And, and, and what, what uh, also the, uh, at the same time, there were all these different reports uh, that began to surface uh, within the media about the, the different bacteria that are uh, uh, populating or invading these kind of war zone or emerging from these war zones. Um, and and the the coverage of that began to also be uh, very much uh, uh, explore uh, how war is 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 giving rise to some of this bacteria. Although the 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 clear processes of that was not really articulated, uh, but this was became the challenge for us to think about some of these problems. So one of the things that uh, uh, these reports have been trying to show is that un during war and under war conditions, specifically in the Middle East, there is some kind of what we call an antibiotic anarchy. The usage of antibiotics increases uh, because of uh, the the rise of infections, uh, because also of the uh, absence of regulation, the collapse of sanitation control. So, so this idea of unruliness comes back again for me to be to haunt a question about the region and about kind of. Uh, 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 medicine and 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 this ungovernability of these spaces, speci specifically under these uh, these conditions. So one of the things that I tried to uh, do back then is uh, I I 
I started working with a, a very good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta, whose picture is here. Uh, and we uh, began documenting a lot of this, uh, these uh, events and a lot of these problems and writing about them. And we slowly developed uh, something called the Conflict Medicine Program, where we uh, were looking at the physical, the social, and the mental kind of uh, manifestations of war wounds and thinking, especially working with him as a plastic surgeon, uh, his experience in dealing with wounds in the Middle East and in, in other settings ha was uh, was so essential in in thinking about uh, in, in in understanding the tech the technical and the um, medical aspect of that, and of course with that comes in a, a historical and an ethnographic component that begins to draw connections and. Uh, uh, and develop uh, all these different ways of thinking about these uh, these problems. And and I encourage people to uh, read a recent uh, issue in Merip uh, where uh, I I interviewed Ghassan and to talk about our work. But also it's an issue that's trying to look at, uh, on this idea of the unraveling or the collapse of healthcare across these different states uh, in in the region. So, so uh, some observations from the work that we have done. So one, one thing is that multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter bomanii begins to emerge as a global threat after the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, and this it, it has also to do a lot with the changing nature of contemporary conflicts and the failure of reconstruction. Um, and, and these are all have led to the collapse of infection control in civilian hospitals and the movement of these wounded uh, individuals and families across regional therapeutic hubs. And of course, with that, with the, that movement, a lot of these infections are also moving with the, uh, uh, with the displaced. And so the other kind of uh, note here is that the, the use and the abuse of antibiotics during war and sanctions have seems to have contributed to this pervasiveness of antibiotic anarchy and uh, the conditions of hospital care in conflict settings further uh, uh, questions this dichotomy between community and hospital acquired infections. And, and I, I can kind of come back maybe later on to this point in the discussion. Uh, the the other issue that became very clear as as we uh, investigated this problem is that the chemical milieu of war and antimicrobial resistance there is a kind of a selective environmental events uh, a heavy metal contamination of soil and water has been shown to drive antimicrobial uh, resistance in different bacterial species including uh, uh, Acinetobacter bumanii so. So the, the, the question here is that this contamination of toxins and, and from uh, the, the, the collapsed uh, urban uh, uh, infrastructure from the uh, war munition seems to be also, or at least hypothetically, contributing to the resistance. And I'll come to this point in a little bit. Um, the other point here is Acinetobacter bumanii appears ideally situated to acquire and maintain and transmit a lot of these uh, these genes, mainly because of its own structure and its own uh, uh, kind of uh, process of uh, gene transfer that it has uh, as a, as a specifically as a bacteria. Uh, and and what, what, what we saw as a kind of part of the global health problem is this tendency to treat this phenomena of resistance as a kind of homogenous response to any use of antibiotics. So everywhere in the world, it's a problem of antibiotic use, uh, but not really looking specifically at what we call in, in medical anthropology local biologies, these specific historical, historical uh, and uh, local uh, processes that produces biological variances and biological differences in different in, in these in these different places so um so so we, we began a kind of effort to rally a lot of people around us uh, mainly uh, clinicians uh, people who work on policy, microbiologists, social scientists, historians of medicine, to develop a team and to work together to think about how can we uh, uh, respond to this problem or how to, can we investigate this problem from a very interdisciplinary perspective. And, and one of the main hypotheses that we developed 
uh, during this work is that heavy metals, specifically uh, in conflict settings in the Middle East, it seems to be the driving uh, global antibiotic resistance. And this is, this is happening through a process that is called co-resistance. To simplify this, uh, basically when bacteria gets exposed to a heavy metal in the environment, it develops a, a resistance to that heavy metal. But that resistance or the mechanism of resistance, uh, which usually is through pumps that that kind of, uh, you know, every time there is a saturation of this metal uh, inside the bacteria, these pumps pump them outside. These same pumps are the ones that could be, uh, uh, could regulate antibiotics out of the bacteria. So, so co-resistance here is that development of resistance to heavy metals equals a development of resistance to antibiotics. So it's kind of both at the same time. It's happening because of the heavy metals. So that's a theory that we began to try to think about and, 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 and develop. So, so we developed this really comprehensive uh, uh, project. It had a clinical component where we were planning to uh, explore uh, fresh wounds from cohorts of wounded uh, patients in Iraq and in Palestine. And uh, we were planning to do environmental research uh, on these areas that have been bombed and check for the relationship between heavy metals and the bacteria. We wanted to uh, look microbiologically at the bacteria and do all these kind of experimental and descriptive analysis. And then also do a, a kind of a broad ethnographic study of looking at how patients and their families are dealing with injury and what kind of what kind of trajectories of, of, of wounding and wounds do we have here. And, and we, we tried to apply uh, for major grants. The project was uh, very well received, but always fell uh, uh, in the last stages of these applications. So these are mainly grants with like 6 million euros or 10 million pounds. And, and we, they were really these big projects and it, it seemed like the project was very well situated. We had, we had the, the top notch scientists working on these questions, uh, in Europe and in the United States and in the Middle East. Uh, but it seems like, you know, uh, there was a lot of, uh, politics also in in uh, denying us some of these uh, some of these funds. So so what really kind of uh, uh, put a kind of a, a halt on this project is a couple of events. You know, again another biology of history story. Um, it was basically the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic because that kind of uh, paralyzed uh, any kind of research that could be done in the region. And of course Beirut, which was a kind of one of the few places that we were able to function in uh, uh, also because of the financial crisis and the recent bomb, uh, the, the recent Beirut explosion uh, completely also paralyzed the work in the university. Uh, I, I had kind of luckily left uh, the university just before all of this. Uh, my colleague Hassan uh, also had to uh, leave the uh, Beirut and, and now the, a lot of this work has, has, has become kind of suspended uh, until we figure out what happens after COVID. Uh, however, a small part of this project still on, is ongoing. Uh, we have discovered these about 2,000 isolates of Acinetobacter bumanii from the 1960s until the present day in the freezers of the American University of Beirut. And, and there is now effort by colleagues in Beirut in Germany and in Canada uh, to uh, actually do uh, a complete uh, 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 phylogenetic analysis of this bacteria. So this is this is a kind of a way of creating kinship uh, trees uh, or kinship for this bacteria, figuring out wh how can we look or how can we kind of trace these evolutionary events uh, throughout history and how if we can actually uh, 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 project or superimpose some of these uh, more political temporalities, political events of war over these kind of evolutionary events, what would we find from doing this analysis? So, so it's a kind of a very interesting experiment because it's it really dealing with different kinds of temporalities at the level of gene uh, mutation and at the level of political political transformation and 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 we'll see you know in time uh, uh, you know hopefully we can think uh, we can if, if there are some findings there we can kind of uh, 
develop a kind of a framework or a, 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 a kind of a, a hypothesis from, from this work. Um, the other working hypothesis, which I've been kind of mostly concerned with and I'm uh, think, trying to write about right now, is that the impact of the, uh, the, uh, the 12 years of uh, Gulf War and sanctions in Iraq had been one of the uh, drivers of the rise of uh, multidrug resistance in, in, uh, in the country. Um, the, you know, the, I, I, as a physician, I really started medical school in, in, 19, in the early 1990s and graduated in 98 and through, and, 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 uh, 97. And in 98, I worked as a physician in Baghdad's largest medical center. And over there, I, I saw and witnessed the collapse of healthcare and the rise of infections, the, the collapse of uh, uh, surgical wound care at that time. It felt for us as doctors working in, in the hospital, there was a kind of a, almost an invisible war, although it was a very apparent war. There was a, almost a biological logical warfare um, uh, w dealing with with the collapse of of uh, uh, of the healthcare system but also with the rise of infections and rise of uh, diseases amongst the population and one of the kind of things that I'm trying now to write about is looking at this transformation of how wound care uh, transformed under the uh, uh, under the sanctions uh, especially because we began using a, a lot of antibiotics to protect the patients from any infection from the ward because the hospital became a kind of a toxic a toxic place and I'm happy also to kind of talk more about this um, and I'll end here with a kind of a quote from uh, my book Ungovernable Life because I uh, although I deal with the history, it's only in the conclusion that I open up this conversation about Iraqi Bakhtar and about the, the present moment in Iraq and what can we think of, uh, how we can kind of uh, understand it in relationship to this history. So to quote uh, myself here, the Iraq experiment seems to have conditioned an ecology of state collapse that has spread like a pathogen to states elsewhere in the region and has potential of spreading beyond under the guise of the global war on terror. Symptomatic of this ecology is the breakdown of once robust healthcare systems. Whether this collapse has been part of systematic efforts to dismantle the state and render life ungovernable or merely a byproduct of, conti of contingencies like Western powers ignorance disorganization and bad faith, this cannot be answered here. It's the ironic, it is ironic, however, how after Iraq's decades long struggle to establish and improve a national healthcare infrastructure, the afflictions suffered by Iraqis today each echo the, echo the orientalizing pathologies that the first generation of British Indian army officers ascribed to the land they would occupy. Depictions of toxic environments riddled with tropical maladies have been superseded by clinical reports of a spike in cancer rate and the spread of Iraqi Bacter, both formed in the crucible of international sanctions, conquest, and occupation. There is a cruel symmetry in this imperial legacy. Thank you.